be seated. If you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. You've been here for the past few weeks, or I guess any of the previous weeks. We are walking through the book of Philippians. The book's theme is joy. And so the title of the message series is Joy on Purpose. We're going to look at yet another dimension of joy today. I want to do so by uh, giving an illustration. How many of you were able to see the, the riding lawnmower that was out in the front as you walked in today? Hopefully, <laughs> okay, hopefully you saw it. You know, you could have run into it, you know. We have a team of people who take care of the lawn, um, and John Peters and Jeff Crumpton, particular guys that are over at 242 and the three acres that are over there taking care of that. And they uh, do so with that riding lawnmower. Imagine if you were to be driving by one day and you were to see Jeff out there and instead of riding on that lawnmower, Jeff was pushing it. And you thought, well, it must be broken down or something. He's pushing it back to the, you know, to the storage shed and maybe it's messed up. But you continue to watch old Jeff out there and you begin to see that Jeff's not pushing it because it's messed up. He's pushing it trying to cut the grass. And he's behind it and he's going in rows and he's hoping that he can cut the grass by pushing the lawnmower. Now, how long would it take for you to conclude that Jeff is an idiot? (laughs) It, it, It wouldn't take too long, would it? How long would it take for Jeff to quit that plan? wouldn't take long. That's an illustration of what I'm talking about today. It's a great illustration of the Christian life. It reminds me also of the story of a guy who went into a hardware store and he uh, went up and he saw that chainsaws were on sale and it had a sign on the chainsaw stack and it said, these chainsaws will cut a cord of wood per day. The guy said, wow, okay, great. So he takes and buys one of those chainsaws. He takes it out. He uses it. He comes back to the store the next day, and he says to the salesperson, hey, listen, I only could cut a half a cord of wood yesterday. The guy said, well, I'm sure, you know, if you use this correctly, you know, it's going to be okay. So he said, try it again. If it doesn't work, bring it back. So he takes it back out, and he brings it back the next day, and he says, I could only cut two-thirds a cord of wood. And the salesman says, well, I just don't understand that. So he takes the chainsaw, he, he pulls the cord, and boom, 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 it starts up, and the guy says, hey, what's that? <laughs> Trying to use the chainsaw in a way that it was never designed. Now, actually, that's an Aggie joke, but I respect our a and graduates <laughs> too much to actually refer to Aggies. Using something in a way that it was never designed. Now, this is true about the Christian life. And in fact, the point that I'm going to illustrate for you today is a deceptive thief of joy. It's one of the most deceptive ways that we lose our joy. Remember last week we talked about how Satan's target is not our salvation because he knows sometimes better than we know that our salvation is secure, that it's eternal, that it's never going away. So instead of targeting our salvation, the target of Satan is often the joy of our salvation. And one of the most deceptive ways that Satan steals us of the joy of our salvation is to get people to live the Christian life in and of their own strength and power. If he can get you to live your life in Christ according to your own knowledge, according to your own strength, according to your own energy, according to your own power, then he has a foothold by which to steal your joy. There is nothing that creates a more burned out, frustrated, and joyless Christian than a Christian who is seeking to live their life in and of their own strength. Now think about it. It's, it's ironic, isn't it? Because at the point of salvation, when we first came to place our trust in Christ, it was an admission that we couldn't earn or deserve our salvation. It was uh, an admission that we couldn't uh, 
work our way in some way to please God. And so we were able to receive from God that which we could never do in and of ourselves. And many people have that experience, but they leave that experience after becoming a Christian only to then live their lives in and of their own strength. And the very faith that they gained through submission to God's power and God's strength, they then leave in the process of living their Christian lives because they begin to work it and to strive for it in and of themselves. It's a deceptive trap. And so Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. He's warning them against this trap. He's warning them about living the Christian life in and of their own strength. And instead, he's saying that the Christian life should be lived from the inside out. Many Christians live with the idea that I am to live for God. Now, in and of itself, that's not harmless. But taken to an extreme and really misapplied, what that begins to dictate in our lives is that we begin to live for God on behalf of God in order to please Him. And really the idea of the New Testament is not that I live for God, but instead it is that I allow God to live through me. It's a big, big difference. So let's investigate that today. Paul is writing the church in Philippi. In chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 is where we are. In this text, there are three concepts. Three concepts. And I'm going to share these three concepts with you by way of three phrases which really do uh, illustrate what Paul is talking about here and are contained in this passage. Now, all three of these phrases must be taken together. If you take one without the other, you're going to have a misconception about what it means to live the Christian life. That's why Paul puts them all together. So let's read together Philippians 2, beginning in verse 12. He says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Very short passage, but very, very profound. If you can get this as a Christian, if you can understand this, this will take you miles and miles away from the process of you becoming mature, in your faith. So now Paul begins this passage with kind of a qualification. He talks about how the church in Philippi had obeyed the teachings of Christ, not only in his presence, but now much more, he says, in his absence. Now, isn't this interesting? So what Paul is essentially saying is, say, is saying this. You're obeying not just when the preacher's around. You're obeying not just when the pastor's watching that your obedience is much bigger than just putting on a Sunday face, that your faith is authentic. It's so funny that when I'm in different circles, uh, for instance, when I've played golf on occasion, I play golf and I'm with a group of guys and some of them know me, some of them don't, and there's a certain language that men pick up on the golf course. And um, after two or three holes, you know, I've had the experience where the guys that know me say, hey, this guy's a pastor, (laughs) you know. And, and it's amazing how things change at that point, you know. It's like I'm from a different planet or something, and the guy says, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. And normally I just kind of give grace and that kind of thing, and, I, you know, I, I say, you know, I grew up hearing that kind of stuff, so, you know, I understand how difficult it is to con- control your mouth when you're on the golf course. But what I really am thinking, I say, listen, you know, you shouldn't really worry about me you've got somebody else you ought to worry about. You've got a God in heaven to worry about as compared to me. And so the idea here that Paul is communicating is, listen, your obedience is authentic. It's not just a Sunday thing, and it's not just when I'm there. It's true. It's real. And then he goes on to describe these three aspects of how we are to live our Christian life. And I want to, again, share these with you through three phrases. The first phrase is the phrase, work out. And that's found 
in verse 12. He says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this is so important to understand. If you miss this, you really miss the whole point. Notice the phrase is not work for your salvation with fear and trembling. Big difference between those two. Because there are some traditions that will teach that Paul is here referring to a works type of salvation where you must earn or deserve and work for salvation. So the mindset is this. Well, if I obey the Ten Commandments, if I'm really a good guy, then eventually I'm going to get good enough where God is going to be pleased and he's going to grant me salvation by my own goodness. That's not what Paul is talking about here. He doesn't say work for your salvation. He says work out your salvation. And all throughout the New Testament, we understand that salvation is ours as a result of grace. In fact, Paul in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, It is by grace that you're saved, not by works. He says, not by your own boasting, but by faith. So Paul is not contradicting himself. He's using a phrase here that has to be clearly understood. In other words, the presumption is, if you were to work out your salvation, it presumes that there is a work already going on inside of you. That which is on the inside must come out. So we don't work for our salvation. Christ gave to us what we could never do for ourselves. And that is the free gift of eternal life through the death of Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying here, listen, that which is on the inside, you must let out. You must let it go. You must let it come out. And he's going to qualify how it's going to come out. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But this is vitally important to understand. Salvation is a free gift for all of those who say yes to the work and to the death of Christ on the cross. Dr. David Youth, he's the pastor at First Baptist Church, Orlando, Florida. He described a story that occurred with him a few years ago where he was invited to go to Pakistan to speak at a mosque. And the religious leader there in that mosque, in the Muslim faith, invited him to come and to share with leaders what Christianity was all about and he thought it was a wonderful wonderful privilege so he went and indeed he shared with a group of people what Christianity was all about and what the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ meant for mankind and then he was able to hear uh, responses to the claims that he had made about Christ and take questions even from others who were there And then at a point in time, he was able to ask some questions also. And after the meeting was over with, he went to the Muslim cleric and he said, let me ask you something. He said, how do you know when you've done enough to please Allah? How do you know when you've done enough to please Allah? And the Muslim leader said, we don't know. He said, we live between fear and fear. And hope. David Youth says, just within his spirit, he thought to himself, Thank you, Father, for amazing grace that has saved us, that was offered to us free. Because of that grace that was given to us as a free gift, we stand confident in our position with Christ that we are saved, we are being saved, and we will always be saved that Christ is in us and that the gift of God could never be earned or deserved. Can you imagine a life where people think to themselves that they must continually strive and work to earn the favor of God? The Bible says we can never, ever earn it or deserve it. Someone once said that religion is spelled D-O. Christianity, however, is spelled D-O-N-E. It was done for us, given to us. So that which has been done for us 
is what we must allow to come out. It presumes, again, something on the inside. And Paul is saying, let that work out of you the powerful, powerful work of the salvation that you've received. Now, in the English language, we have an active voice verb. We have a passive voice verb. And the Greek language is a little bit different, the language of the New Testament. So the active voice is where... uh, the person who is the subject is doing the action. For instance, Mike ran. Mike is the one that is running. In the English language, we would have a passive voice verb. This is where I might say, Mike was run over. In other words, Mike has received something from some outside source. Mike was a recipient of the action. It wasn't that I was doing the action. It was that I was acted upon. In the Greek language, there's a middle voice verb. This is really important to understand because the word here, work out, is a middle voice verb. And so in the English language, although we don't really have an equivalent, it might be said, Mike ran over himself. In other words, Mike did something. He acted, but he was also acted upon in some way. This verb, work out your salvation, is a middle voice verb. In other words, there is a part that we play. There is an action that we have, but we are also acted upon. So the big question mark is, well, what's the action? What are we to do? Well, the Bible is really clear about that. What is our role in salvation? Our role in salvation is simply to say yes. As we say yes to Christ then we receive and are acted upon by God. That's the way it works. So this first phrase here denotes our part. Work out your salvation. Put yourself in a position where your salvation can be expressed. Essentially, it means get out of God's way. Get out of God's way. You know, I'm a fan of basketball, and so we were watching the game last night. I was disappointed about the Suns losing because I'm a fan of any team that's playing the Lakers. But we're we're a big basketball family, and and, uh, I remember back in the old days when I really became a basketball fan was the Larry Bird and the Magic Johnson, the Michael Jordan days. That's when basketball was really, really fun for me. Well, there's a story about Larry Bird at the retirement of his jersey there in Boston Garden. His coach, Casey Jones, told this story at the retirement of his jersey. Casey tells about a story where toward the end of the game, they were behind by one point. And Casey calls a timeout and he brings the team over to the huddle and he brings out his clipboard. He draws up a play. He shows the players the play. And at the end of him explaining this play to the players, Larry Bird steps in and he says, guys, just get me the ball and get out of the way. (laughs) And Casey Jones tells the story about how in that moment he said, Larry, excuse me, but I'm the coach, you're the player, I will be the one who draws up the play that we will do. And so Casey turns to the rest of the players and he says, guys, just give him the ball and get out of the way. (laughs) That's really what it means to be a Christian. We say the phrase, let go and let God. And that's a cliché. But the truth is, that's the way to live the Christian life, is to give Christ the ball and to get out of the way. So there's a phrase here at the end of this. The phrase is fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. What does that mean? Paul says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, Paul uses this phrase another time. I've always wondered about this passage. I've said, what could this mean? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's a type of fear that's referred to in the Bible that is a fear of reverence, a fear of respect. And this is a word phrase that Paul uses in Philippians 2, but he also uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and it's not in your notes, but let me read it for you because it's put in a whole different context, and it helps us understand what Paul is talking about. He says in 2 Corinthians 7, In addition to your own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. Now, Paul sent Titus to the church in Corinth. 
And there Titus was ministered to. And as Paul says, he was refreshed. He says, I had boasted to him about you, and you've not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has been proved true as well. And his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, receiving him with fear and trembling. I'm glad I can have complete confidence in you. Now, what is Paul saying? He uses the same phrase. He's talking about receiving Titus with reverence and with awe as a special gift. That's really the whole point of this fear and trembling aspect. It's not to quake in our boots for fear that we might not please God or we might not be able to earn our salvation. This is in recognition that the gift of salvation is a very, very special gift. And Paul is reminding them of the wonder of that gift and the reverence and respect that should take place because of that gift. And I'm afraid that we as Christians, as we get along, maybe as Paul was concerned about even with the church in Philippi, we as Christians get along in our Christian life and we forget the wonder of what it means to have the free gift of salvation in our lives. And the gift that was offered to us. And Paul is saying when you think about that salvation, it should evoke a sense of awe and wonder and reverence and respect that we get to have that gift. And it's a powerful, powerful thought. One of the things that we do as Christians is that we forget all that God has done for us. One of the reasons that Memorial Day is so special is because we remember the sacrifice, right? It's a day that we set aside to remember what was done for us. It's a solemn day. It's an honorable day. And as we go along in our country... Maybe we're forgetting about what it means for people to give their lives for us. Years and years ago, I went to the movie Saving Private Ryan, and I was sitting there, and there was a bunch of young teenagers, probably junior high kids, I guess, that were sitting on the front row. And you remember the first time you saw that movie. It was in the movie theaters, the surround sound, and those first 20 minutes of that movie when they land there on the beaches of Normandy. And I was sitting there just in wonder and awe and respect and reverence for what had taken place. And these kids on the front row were slapping each other and laughing. And I thought, they have no clue what was given for them. We can do the same thing with respect to all that Christ has given us. We can forget We have communion this coming Wednesday night. It's a way that we remember with awe and with reverence the death of Jesus on the cross. And that is what Paul is talking about here. Deep gratitude, honoring the gift. Because the opposite of that would mean carelessness. The opposite of that would mean a a familiarity that that breeds kind of carelessness and a lack of caution with respect to stewarding that gift that's been given to us. So when we think about the salvation being expressed in our life, we should understand that it is an awesome, awesome gift. Work out. Secondly, work in. Work in. That's the next phrase. Verse 13, For it is God who works in you. For it is God who works in you. So verse 12, Our part, work out our salvation. Again, think about Jeff on that tractor. Jeff has to get in the seat of the tractor in order for the tractor to do the things that it needs to do. That's his working out of the experience of the tractor. Same thing is true with us. We put ourselves in a position. That's our role. That's our job. Because, Paul clarifies, because it is God who works in you. So as we let the salvation out in our lives, we understand its true value. God's part is His work in us, not our work for Him. This is so key. So the key, the focus to our Christian lives is to focus on God's work in us, not the work that we do for Him. God's work in us, not the work we do for Him. And if that can remain the focus of your Christian life, it will make an amazing difference for you as you live it. You see, there are really two plans to live the Christian life. 
You can do so in and of your own strength. That's the plan that we would call the works plan. I will work for it. I will strive for it. I will earn it. I will deserve it. Or there is the grace plan. The works plan is about our strength. The grace plan is about God's strength. Two very different focuses in our life. Well, let me just share with you some words that clarify that focus for us. And I want you to run down this list, and I want you in your mind to think about, you know, what do I tend to see in my life? How is my Christian life characterized? Which list? On the work side, pleasing God. We work to please God. On the grace side, our focus is not pleasing God. Our focus is trusting God. On the work side, our focus is committing to God. On the grace side, our focus is surrendering to God. Big difference. On the work side, it is about earning God's love. Maybe if I work hard enough, then God will be pleased with me. You know, I I know he loves me because that's a part of his job description, but I don't think he really likes me that much. So I'm going to work really, really hard to try to earn God's love. But on the grace side, our focus is not earning God's love. It is instead receiving God's love. On the work side, it's characterized by striving and striving. On the grace side, it's not striving, it's resting in. On the work side, it's about legalism. On the grace side, it's about love. On the work side, it's about comparing myself to other people. How well am I doing? How holy am I compared to them? On the grace side, it's not about comparing myself. On the grace side, it's about accepting myself. On the work side, it's about judgmentalism. On the grace side, it's about grace giving, not judging others. On the work side, it's about rules. On the grace side, it's about relationship. On the work side, it's about what I do for God. That's my focus, what I do for God. On the grace side, my focus is not what I do for God, but instead it is who I am in Christ. Which list characterizes you? And as a result, frustration, burnout, and a lack of joy. So imagine for a moment that you decided that you were going to take a trip from Houston to New York. You have one of three ways to accomplish that trip. You can walk, completely trusting yourself, in and of your own effort, in and of your own strength. You can drive, halfway trusting yourself, halfway trusting the car, that you're driving, or you can fly, fully trusting the pilot to get you from Houston to New York. Guess what I like to do? (laughs) I like to fly, and I like to sit there, and I like to relax, and I like to leave the work to all these other people who are buzzing around me. And to trust that pilot and that plane to get me to where I want to go. The Christian faith is a lot like that. We can do it in and of our own effort. Or we can have faith in God to do through us what we can never ever do on our own. Think about it for a moment. If you were living your life in and of your own strength, I wonder, do you ever see anything supernatural occur? Aren't you limited by your own power and your own strength and your own abilities? Sure you are. Aren't you limited by your own knowledge? By your limited knowledge. You don't know the past, the present, the future. You don't know as God knows. And so trusting yourself for the Christian life is a life that is lived with a limitation of some kind with respect to the knowledge that God has. It's in and of our own strength and in our own resources. And yet God offers so much more. And so it means me not saying, God, I'm going to live for you. Instead, it means, God, I'm going to allow you to live through me. And so, God, you're going to be the energy to every expectation of my life. 
And I'm going to follow you because you may want to take me someplace that I don't know about. You know what's best. I trust you. You live through me. God, I can't live for you. I will fail if I do that. Really, that's the only thing that God expects of you and me (laughs) is ultimately that we will fail at trying to live for him. He says, stop trying and instead start dying. Stop with the effort. Stop with the commitment. How many of you have been guilty of the cycle like I've had in my life? I commit. God, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to live for you as if God needs me to live for him, right? I'm going to do some good things for you. I commit. I give a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of self-will only to eventually not meet the expectations that I made of myself, only to eventually acknowledge that I have failed, only then to feel guilty, only then as a result of my guilt to be distant from God, then to recommit myself to more effort and more energy and more of me, to failure, to guilt, to recommitment, to failure, to guilt, to recommitment. I tell you what, that was a miserable Christian life for me. And I got off of that wheel a few years ago. And I fell headlong into grace. And I remember that night getting on my knees and saying, God, I can't live for you. And it was as if God said to me, Mike, you're right, you can't. You can't, but I can through you. So stop committing. Commitment says I can and start surrendering. Surrendering says I can't and wave the white flag and say, God, I can't. But God, because I can't is evidence that you can. And so, God, I will allow you to set the expectations in my life and I will allow you to live through me and I I will rid myself of the legalism and the comparing myself and the works and the striving and the recommitment of my life and this cycle, this wheel I find myself on and I'm going to give myself to you and I'm not going to place anything else except I'm just going to say, God, I can't. And I, by faith, trust you. And you know what I found? I found that God has taken me places that I could have never gone in and of my own knowledge and in and of my own strength. I I found that the Christian life is enjoyable. That it's not to be endured, it's to be enjoyed. I found that supernaturally things have occurred in my life. And that there are some things that are different about me that never could have taken place by my own strength. And is that because of Mike? No, it's because of the work of God and His grace and that He would change me from the inside out and bring to me a righteousness, as Paul says in Philippians 3, a righteousness that is not of my own, but is by faith. Work out, work in, and then I need to finish up. The third phrase (laughs) is just icing on the cake. So as we experience the work out of our salvation and the work in with respect to God's work in us, all these two results in the work through that God will accomplish in us. So verse 13, Paul says, to will and to act according to his good purpose. To will and to act. Will literally meaning desire. That God will put in you a desire. What Paul is saying here is that your want to's change as a result of this working out of your salvation as a result of the work of God in you. Your want to's change. And some of you who are new to faith have experienced this. You've told me about it. You've told me how God is bringing change in your life and you have different desires in your life and you have some friends that really aren't Christians or friends that uh, don't understand their faith and and they really have different want-tos than you, but you have different want-tos and that's because of Christ's work in you. But not only different want-tos, different desires, but he says also to act, different conduct. 
It's not just the desires of the Christian life, but it's the do's of the Christian life, that God does give us the ability to actually do the things in our lives. And again, some of you are finding yourself not only with different desires, but different do's. You're doing some things. You're attending church. You're like, man, I'm First time I walked in here, I thought the roof was going to cave in. You hadn't been in church in so long. You know, it's one of those, I, I can't believe I'm going to church. I can't believe I'm reading my Bible. I can't believe I'm praying. I can't believe I'm hungry for the things of God. You're actually doing some things. That's because of the work of God in you. And be careful. It's not because of your own work. It's because of the work of God. And so the desires, the doing, but then also all of this ultimately leads according to His good purpose. Our want-tos change, our conduct changes, and ultimately we accomplish God's purpose for our lives, not our purpose for ourselves. He puts the desires in our hearts. He gives us the supernatural ability to conduct ourselves in a way that is honoring to Him. And ultimately when we do, He is pleased and we accomplish His good purpose. That's the sequence not the other way around. Well, God, let me find out what your purpose is. And I'll tell you what, then I'll try really hard and then maybe eventually I'll really want to accomplish your purpose. No. The other way around. The work out, the work in, and the work through. So, what's it going to be for you? What's the plan of your Christian life? Is it the works plan? Is it the grace plan? Jeff, hand me that sign right there. You're going to push or you're going to ride? Riding is much more joy filled, believe me. You can try the other. You'll mow a row or two. but you'll never, ever experience anything else beyond what you can think and what you can do. But by faith, trusting God to give you the desires of your heart where your want-tos will change, to work through you in such a way that your behavior changes too, and then ultimately all of that leads to the accomplishment of His good purpose. I remember preaching this message a few years ago, and... um, lady came up to me after the service. She said, Mike, I've been a Christian for 25 years. I've never learned what you just shared today. She said, I'm so tired. That's the Christian life for many. It can be different for you. It can be different for me. Jesus looked at a crowd of people in Matthew chapter 11. He said this to them. He said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You say, I will give you more to do. I'll pile on. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray together.